In the mid-1990s, I had the opportunity to visit a breathtaking lowland rainforest in Malaysian Borneo. That forest, with its towering trees, crystal clear streams, and a spectacular array of wildlife, including hornbills and endangered orangutans, left an indelible mark on my memory. Tragically, a few months after my visit, this lush rainforest was decimated, eventually giving way to an oil palm plantation. This devastating transformation ignited my journey to establish Mogabe. Over the years, I've borne witness to escalating environmental destruction globally. Indeed, 2023 was the hottest year on record. We saw severe droughts from the Amazon to Sumatra, and species extinction rates have soared to at least a thousand times normal. And in the first few weeks of 2024, We've experienced the warmest ever ocean temperatures, received new evidence that the Atlantic meridional overturning current is showing early signs of collapse, had scientists tell us the time frame for the die off of the Amazon rainforest is sooner than previously thought, and seen torrential storms in Southern California. These alarming statistics could easily lead to despair and inaction yet Manga Bay remains committed to documenting these harsh realities. In fact, I've been told Manga Bay is the most depressing site on the internet. Despite these grim observations, there is still room for hope. Fueled by stories, our global network of journalists is delivering from nature's front line. This isn't about naive optimism. It's about being realistically hopeful, recognizing emerging trends that could help us mitigate these crises. One such trend, somewhat counterintuitive, is the shift in who's most responsible for environmental degradation. Today, a growing share of damage is driven by corporations and governments rather than subsistence activities. In other words, we're shifting from poverty-driven to profit-driven environmental degradation. In other words, we're moving from this smallholder deforestation to this large-scale forest conversion. This shift is significant because it narrows the focus to fewer entities causing major planetary harm. For instance, tackling deforestation once meant working to per persuade poor farmers to protect forests when their primary concern was putting food on the table for their families. Now that most deforestation is driven by commodity production for urban and export markets, Saving forests often involves urging companies and governments to adopt more environmentally friendly practices that don't necessarily undercut productivity or profits and can yield other gains from improved supply chain management and operational efficiency. This shift has given environmental activists new leverage and tools to push for change. A prime example of this power is evident in a series of Greenpeace campaigns that began in the mid-2000s. These campaigns targeted some of the largest drivers of deforestation, including the palm oil industry in Indonesia, as well as the soy and cattle industries in the Brazilian Amazon. They shared a common approach, targeting large, conspicuous consumer-facing companies that sell in Western markets. In the years that followed, hundreds of companies committed to eliminate deforestation from their supply chains. Ultimately, these weren't just Western companies. Many of the world's largest companies made these commitments. They were followed by governments, which declared targets to bar commodities linked to tropical deforestation from their markets. The results from these developments have been tangible. Deforestation associated with palm oil has plunged 90% in Malaysia and Indonesia since the early 2000s, while the Amazon rainforest clearing for soy has also declined sharply. Of course, there's still a long way to go. Many have fallen short on their promises, but there are more tools than ever before to monitor and verify compliance, which brings me to another major trend, which gives me hope, rapid advancements in remote sensing. Data from satellites, camera traps, and bioacoustic devices are now widely used by civil society groups, corporations, governments, and journalists to see what is happening on timescales relevant for action. This is having a real impact. Research by the Climate Policy Initiative attributed three-fifths three 
of the decline in deforestation of Brazil and Amazon over a five-year period to the country's monitoring system. That deforestation monitoring capability has since been expanded around the world and now goes well beyond where it stood just five years ago. Radar is even allowing observers to see through clouds and smoke, detecting changes in forest cover that used to be obscured. Furthermore, platforms like Planet have greatly increased the frequency of updates. Imagery from around the tropics is now freely accessible via Global Forest Watch, democratizing this data and empowering actors, including non-experts non from around the world. Or another consequence of this is it's getting harder for bad actors to hide. One of my favorite examples of what satellites have enabled comes from a Manga Bay investigation several years ago. In 2014, a cacao company had an IPO in London, raising millions of dollars. The company portrayed itself as a good corporate citizen, producing a product that most people love in a responsible way. It was a nice story, but it was completely false. The problem was no one knew it at the time. While the company was celebrating its IPO, satellite images of the Peruvian Amazon showed large-scale clear-cutting. Using satellite data, Mangabe journals could see that the company had actually been destroying large tracts of Amazon rainforest in one of the most biodiverse places on Earth. We sent an investigative reporter to see things on the ground, and we worked with a wide range of NGOs and scientists who were studying this area to get the best data on what was there before the company started its activities and what it was now. The company did the company didn't take kindly to our investigative work and tried to stop the story before publication, but the data was based on the best science and therefore irrefutable. After we published a series of stories, other global outlets covered the issue and activists took, the, took up the cause, prompting the local government to revoke the company's permits. In January 2017, the company was delisted from the stock exchange, depriving it of the critical capital it needed to expand. Further reporting showed that the impact of stopping the company was much larger. Its owner had planned to clear about 100,000 hectares of rainforest through a web of other companies for uh, oil palm plantations and cacao. Because of that delisting, this destruction did not occur. In climate terms, it's about 30 million tons of CO2 emissions that did not end up in the atmosphere. That's the equivalent of about 72 billion miles driven in a car. Another important trend from technology is it's providing new insights. For example, what we've seen with forests is also being extended to oceans. Global Fishing Watch offers unprecedented insights into what's happening in the world's oceans, including legal fishing, which was previously undetectable at scale. This graphic is from Global Fishing Watch. It shows the activity of fishing vessels, both when they're AIS is turned on and their AIS is turned off. So AIS is the public tracking system that uh, sea vessels are supposed to use. Um, the interesting thing about this data is there have already been impacts from it. So uh, the Spanish government recently investigated and sanctioned 25 Spanish flagged fishing vessels for repeatedly turning off their public tracking devices while fishing on the high seas. This is based on the Global Fishing Watch data. Recently released tools are starting to offer similar updates on the world's coral reefs. Closer to the ground, there are other technologies that are offering new insights as well. For example, analysis of the sounds organisms make in an ecosystem, its soundscapes, can help tell us how ecosystems are faring whether they're doing better or worse relative, relative to historical baselines, and what effects conservation is having. For example, research shows that more diverse ecosystems have more diverse soundscapes, meaning that more of the sound spectrum is occupied by calling animals like insects, frogs, birds, and mammals. It can even facilitate action on time scales relevant for addressing deforestation, poaching, or dynamite fishing by offering the capability to send real-time alerts when certain sounds, whether it's a gunshot, chainsaw, underwater explosion, or engine are detected. Combining soundscape data with data from satellites, camera traps, and environmental DNA provides a much fuller picture 
on the condition and trajectory of an ecosystem or ecological community than any single source. New data sources and capacity to analyze big data sets are also improving our understanding of how healthy and productive ecosystems underpin human well-being and why species matter. For example, we now have a much better sense of how biodiversity contributes to carbon sequestration. Animals play a significant role in how much carbon plants, soils, and sediments can capture as they redistribute seeds and nutrients and disturb soil through digging, trampling, nest building, and their life cycle. For example, when a large whale dies and sinks to the bottom of the ocean, it sequesters about 33 tons of, sea of carbon dioxide on average, storing that carbon for centuries. A study published last year in Nature Climate Change extrapolated on the concept of, of animating the carbon cycle, the idea that helping populations of animals recover can accelerate the rate of carbon sequestration and storage in ecosystems. The research estimated that reintroducing nine species or groups of species from African elephants to gray wolves to sea otters to sharks could lead to the capture of 6.4 gigatons of CO2 annually or more than 500 gigatons in total carbon CO2 removal by 2100. That's most of the amount of carbon scientists say needs to be removed from the atmosphere to ensure global warming remains below 1.5 degrees Celsius, whereas, which is where we currently stand. Restoring these populations implies conserving some of the world's most biologically rich and productive habitats and the services they afford, like stabilizing coastlines, buffering against extreme weather events, and maintaining precipitation patterns. This kind of research could also usher in new innovations. Last year I met with a philanthropist who has proposed paying ship captains a portion of the carbon value of a whale as a mechanism to incentivize avoiding, avoiding whale strikes. Each ship would be outfitted with a pair of drones that would fly miles ahead of the ship. If a whale was sighted, the captain would be alerted in time to take evasive action. The captain of the shipping vessel would be paid thousands of dollars for their effort. The benefits of thriving ecosystems and their constituent species extends far beyond carbon storage and wildlife habitat to include human health, more resilient agriculture and water supplies, and buffering against storm damage and erosion. This knowledge offers the opportunity to broaden the constituency for environmental protection. After all, the escalating severity of environmental degradation is inadvertently but progressively making environmental storylines more relevant to more people, provided they believe the science. But even if they aren't concerned about the science, people are thinking about conservation in new ways based on broadening the constituency around protecting nature. One of my favorite examples comes from Indonesian Borneo. So back in the 2000s, a researcher named Canary Webb started, was studying the orangutan population and what was happening. The population of these great apes was diminishing due to habitat loss and hunting. Uh, Dr. Webb found that one of the biggest drivers of deforestation was logging. And that logging was driven primarily by healthcare costs. So when someone had a healthcare emergency in their family, they would turn to logging in order to generate quick cash. So Dr. Webb went to medical school to get trained as a doctor. She came back to this area, which is in Indonesian Borneo, and started and set it up a clinic. Uh, providing healthcare services to communities. Um, these healthcare services were so good that doctors would actually travel from the city by bus, uh, which was hours away, uh, to get healthcare for themselves and their families. The way it worked is the NGO set up a system where villages that committed to eliminate illegal logging uh, received discounts on their healthcare services. Uh, and there's since been research, research that's shown that indeed villages uh, that phased out logging or that, that had access to this discounted health care uh, were more likely to eliminate deforestation. One of the unexpected benefits of this project pertained to livelihoods. So 
if a family was not able to pay cash for healthcare services, they could uh, do, there were in-kind options. And so one of those options was to work in the organic garden uh, at Health and Harmony's facility. Um, and it turned out that in this area, a lot of small farmers relied very heavily on chemical inputs, which significantly cut into the proceeds from their, their farming. So when they adopted organic farming techniques, they were able to reduce these costs associated with chemical inputs and start to produce different types of crops, especially vegetables. So vegetables are a much higher margin product, and so incomes actually increase. So not only were there these benefits for health, there were uh, benefits for protecting the forest, but then there are also these increases in local livelihoods. So it's a it's a really good great example of how broadening the constituency can bring in more people to uh, support conservation. A broader manifestation of this trend is the flood of interest and money flowing into nature-based solutions, from blue carbon to ecosystem restoration projects. In 2022, an estimated $201 billion was directly invested in nature-based solutions projects, according to a UNEP study. Another reason to have hope is the concept of positive tipping points. Tim Lenton, a prominent climate scientist and director of the Global Systems Institute at the University of Exeter, is a proponent of the concept of positive tipping points in societal systems that could lead to rapid and profound changes in addressing climate change and sustainability issues. These tipping points refer to small changes that can lead to significant shifts in societal behaviors and systems, ultimately contributing to large-scale environmental benefits. Some positive societal tipping points include the EV revolution, the adoption of electric vehicles reaching a tipping point driven by falling costs, technological advancements and policy support and the associated infrastructure, which could drastically reduce carbon emissions from the transportation sector, which is still largely dependent on internal combustion engines. This slide shows EV adoption in Europe. Um, this is a couple years out of date, but Norway's EV market share has since grown significantly for new, new cars. Another example is the renewable energy transition. The rapid adoption of renewable energy technologies such as solar and wind power reaching a tipping point where they become more economical and preferred over fossil fuels, leading to a swift transition to clean energy across the globe. This is already happening in some markets where renewable, energies, so renewable energy options are cheaper than coal. Regenerative agriculture. Widespread adoption of regenerative agricultural practices which restore soil health are better for biodiversity and sequester carbon, reach a tipping point through policy support, consumer demand, and farmer adoption. This could significantly contribute to carbon sequestration and biodiversity conservation. This is a study from 2018 which looked at um, specifically at uh, corn. Uh, regenerative versus conventional agricultural practices. So it looks at the revenue and costs per hectare, um, as well as the amount of uh, tests. Energy efficiency in building. Rapid improvements in the energy efficiency of buildings through retrofitting and green construction practices becoming the norm, driven by policy, technolo technological advances, and societal demand for sustainable living spaces. We're certainly seeing this trend in a lot of markets around the world. Increased focus on the circular economy. The concept of a circular economy, which emphasizes a reuse, recycling, and recovery of materials is, grain, is gaining traction globally. Advancements in sustainable materials. These positive tipping points can synergize with each other, creating a cascade of changes that accelerate the transition to a more sustainable and resilient society. The concept underscores the potential for deliberate actions and policies to leverage these tipping points, mm -hmm. steering the global community towards meeting climate goals and ensuring a more habitable planet for future generations. 
in the conservation realm, while we probably cannot call them tipping points yet, we are seeing substantial shifts in how organizations operate, from how they measure success to how they engage with frontline communities. Gone are the days where fortress conservation tactics are embraced without question. Today, we're seeing a strong emphasis on the role indigenous peoples and local communities play in achieving conservation outcomes. There's growing acknowledgement of the role indigenous peoples and local communities play in maintaining healthy and productive ecosystems. An ever expanding body of research indicates that community managed areas often have significantly lower rates of degradation compared to surrounding areas. These community managed areas are crucial in efforts to protect biodiversity and halt climate change. A few figures in support of this role. At least 36% of the world's intact forests are within indigenous lands. Indigenous territories with strong rights in the Brazilian Amazon showed a significant decrease in deforestation between 1982 and 2016, an effect that did not exist in indigenous lands without full property rights. Indigenous territories with strong land rights in the Brazilian Amazon saw 23% more, for, more forest recovery in areas relative to areas directly outside their borders. So why is this? Indigenous peoples often possess profound knowledge of their local environments developed over generations. This intimate understanding allows them to manage ecosystems sustainably using traditional practices that have proven effective in conserving biodiversity. For many indigenous communities, their territory and its natural resources are not only a means of subsistence, but also deeply intertwined with their cultural identity, spirituality, and heritage. This intrinsic connection fosters a stewardship ethic that prioritizes the health and sustainability of their environments. Indigenous peoples are increasingly gaining legal recognition for their lands and resources, which empowers them to manage their territories effectively and to protect them against external pressures, such as deforestation, mining, and agriculture expansion. Indigenous communities often pioneer innovative conservation solutions that balance ecological health with community well-being. Examples include community-based ecotourism, the establishment of indigenous protected areas and no-take zones and seasons, and the integration of traditional ecological knowledge with modern conservation science. Another thing that gives me hope is restoration is possible. Nature has shown remarkable resilience when given a chance to recover. Protected areas have seen ecosystems rebound, endangered species recover, and water and air quality improve in various places around the world. Last month, I had the great fortune of traveling to Raja Ampat, a region off the northwestern tip of New Guinea. Raja Ampat is a place of spectacular beauty. It has the highest marine biodiversity in the world and incredible rainforests. It's also a place that offers hope in terms of nature's resilience. 20 years ago, Raja Ampat's shark and ray population was substantially diminished by fishing, including shark finning. Conservation efforts, including a ban on commercial fishing and the establishment of no-take zones, has resulted in a dramatic recovery of sharks and rays in some areas. A recent study found that manta ray populations saw up to a 10.7% compound annual increase from 2009 to 2019 in the region, bucking a global trend of decline. Anecdotally, dive operators from modest homestays to resorts catering to well-heeled foreigners have reported a boom in population in the waters, in the waters around their lodges. The logic is basic. When people see that these animals are worth more alive than dead, they have a vested interest in maintaining their numbers. This view even persisted during the pandemic when ecotourism collapsed in Raja Ampat. There were reports of local communities banding together to protect sharks against finners during the worst of the crash. They believed that if shark populations were maintained, the tourists would come back, and they did. Lastly, demographic trends may have positive implications for the other species that share our planet. The human population is now expected to peak before 2080 
at about 10 billion, which is significantly lower than previous estimates. Declining childhood mortality rates, advancements in healthcare, and the empowerment of women are all contributing to this development. Of course, consumption acts as a multiplier on population, so it remains a factor in our future. However, for the first time in centuries, humanity is navigating a future with a substantially smaller population. These are among many promising developments, but their impact is limited if they remain unknown. Awareness is a precursor to action, and it's, this is where the pivotal role of journalism comes into play. Journalism not only informs, but also inspires and mobilizes public action. It's through well-researched, compelling storytelling that the public becomes engaged and motivated to participate in these solutions. Every challenge presents an opportunity for solutions. Addressing the global environmental crisis demands persistent collective action grounded in accurately conveyed facts. At Manga Bay, we recognize this imperative and are increasingly employing solutions journalism to approach environmental issues with a potential focus on how to solve them. We strive to move beyond doom and gloom, highlighting effective, innovative strategies that make a real difference. By presenting these success stories, we not only aim to inform, but to empower. Maintaining hope and optimism is vital in the face of daunting environmental challenges. These sentiments fuel the creativity needed for new technologies, strategies, and approaches. Solutions journalism plays a critical role in fostering this hope by showcasing how challenges can be and are being overcome. This approach doesn't just report on problems, it illuminates the path forward. A prime example of journalism's impact is in Gabon, where Manga Bay's coverage on the Masaha community's struggle against a Chinese logging company led to significant action. Our reporting on this community, which had been protecting a forest for generations, drew the attention of Gabon's environment minister, resulting in him revoking the company's permit and subsequent protection of the community's forests. This was a landmark decision because it was the first time an area will be protected in Gabon at the request of a resident community. Gabon has been typically uh, characterized by top-down conservation approaches, so this was an example of a bottom-up conservation approach. Indeed, there are reasons to remain hopeful. History has shown that societal change can, can happen rapidly and on a large scale. The challenge isn't just about changing quickly enough to avoid the worst environmental impacts. It's about uniting globally to amplify and expand the solutions already in place. Journalism, especially data journalism, plays a critical role in this endeavor. It provides the necessary rigor and accuracy to ensure our efforts are not merely superficial greenwashing, but are genuinely effective. I firmly believe that journalism is more than profession. It's a duty to illuminate often uncomfortable truths essential for change. In the realm of environmental conservation, the role of journalism is indispensable. Before closing, I would be remiss if I failed to address trends in the media landscape and the broader information ecosystem. So I think we're all aware of what's happening in the news media. There are layoffs, entities are shutting down. It's a very challenging time. So why is this? Well, briefly, there are a few High level trends that are really important. So one is that news consumption is declining. So this data from the Reuters Institute at Oxford shows by country trends in people's interest in news. So we can see that across countries it's declining over the past eight years. And even in the countries that have levels which are more stable, there still is this declining trend. Another trend is growing news avoidance. So people who actively avoid the news. So this shows a number of different countries and the trend is pretty much universal. People's reasons for avoiding news are different. Uh, it may be because it upsets them, they dislike the coverage or they distrust journalists. Another trend is the evolving social media landscape, which makes it harder for 
news media to reach and engage their audiences. So essentially what's happening is as the media landscape evolves, media organizations and journalists have to frequently reassess which platforms warrant their time and resources. Additionally, many social platforms are banning or deprioritizing news content. And of course, increased polarization is also a major issue. Many individuals prioritize content that affirms their political beliefs over factual information, making it difficult to engage audiences. These are indeed major challenges for environmental communicators. But our recent experience, which is validated via research by the Reuters Institute at Oxford University, suggests some ways we can continue to reach and engage people in this information ecosystem. First at Mongo Bay, we remain focused on our core strategies, producing high quality original reporting, making our content freely available, taking an iterative approach to navigating shifts in news consumption patterns and distribution. For example, we concentrate on platforms that foster quality engagement, as this is more likely to contribute to tangible impact. Consequently, we've lessened our emphasis on platforms that generate superficial traffic. We've also considered the nature of content that will resonate with readers who may, may be wary of negative news and those with varying political perspectives. For example, we've ramped up our solutions journalism coverage. We've expanded our series on indigenous-led conservation, conservation technology, and nature-based solutions, and produced more explainer content, especially videos. The Reuter Institute data indicates that news avoiders are most likely to engage with such content. Climate change and environmental news has become highly polarized, making it difficult to reach audiences across the political spectrum, including people in key decision-making roles. However, addressing these topics in the context of tech, security, finance, and business implications might engage those who otherwise would disengage. For instance, many of Manga Bay's climate stories are framed around the impact on a species, ecosystem, or local community, sidestepping a political perspective. So this data from the Reuters Institute provides a little more context on this. 64% of people who identify as being on the right and being news avoiders avoid climate and environment news. But for those other topics I mentioned, so business, finance, economics, security, uh, science, uh, people on, who identify as being on the right are less likely to tune out. So again, if you're trying to reach key decision makers and audiences across political spectrum, it might require framing stories in different ways to reach different audiences. So to wrap this up, the path ahead is certainly challenging, but it is not without hope. The journey of Mongo Bay reflects on a broader narrative of environmental conservation, the power of informed, engaged journalism to drive meaningful change. As we confront the multifaceted challenges of climate change and mass extinction, the role of solutions-focused journalism becomes increasingly crucial. It serves as a beacon, guiding us through the complexities of these issues and offering tangible, inspiring examples of progress and possibility. The path ahead is undoubtedly challenging. However, with relentless pursuit of truth and a focus on solutions, journalism has the power to do more than just document the state of our world. It can help transform it for the better. The mission at its core is an act of hope, a belief in the capacity of informed action to create more sustainable, equitable world for generations to come. Thank you.